So today I'm going to tell you about some work we've been doing with the uh, U.S. Army here in Michigan on a trust management framework for calibrating driver trust in semi-automated vehicles. And so by the end of this talk, I hope you'll understand what all those terms mean, at least in this context. So the outline of my talk is pretty straightforward, so I'm just going to jump right in. As we all know from experience, and we've heard about this a little bit today, trust is an important variable in human interaction. And it's also important when humans interact with machines or automation, including robotics. If people trust the system, they're more likely to rely on it. But if, as we move from robots and automation, from being tools to help people get certain tasks done, to being teammates working together in an autonomous fashion, we really need to consider trust. So we define trust as the attitude that an agent will help an individual's goals in a situation that's characterized by uncertainty and vulnerability. Now research has considered what affects trust, how trust evolves over time, and what human behaviors reflect trust, also called trusting behaviors. And we'll consider all of those factors in this work. But we're going to focus not in the general case of trust in automation or trust in robotics, but the trust between drivers and automated vehicles. So you can think of an automated vehicle as a special type of robot that carries people. So there's uncertainty and vulnerability aspects when people are riding in AVs. As we've heard earlier today, there's great expectations for automated vehicles to improve transportation, but only if people trust them appropriately. So what do we mean by trusting appropriately? There's two main types of trust miscalibration that we'd like to avoid. The first is under trust. If the driver doesn't trust the automation to do its job, they may be paying too much attention to the driving and not enough to any secondary task that they're doing, thereby disusing the automation. They're not taking advantage of the, of the capabilities of the automation that could allow the driver to take on other non-driving related tasks, such as watching movies, reading emails, taking a nap. You can imagine a million things you might wanna do in your car besides drive. On the other hand, overtrust is also a problem. If the driver trusts the automation too much and doesn't pay enough attention to the driving situations because they're focusing on their other secondary tasks, problems can occur and very serious ones like accidents. So they're misusing the automation beyond its capabilities. So we want drivers to trust the automation enough so that they can take advantage of it, but not too much that they over rely on the automation and end up in a dangerous scenario. So our goal is to calibrate their trust. So let's move into the work. I'll start by telling you about the experimental setup that we have. You can see a picture of it here on the right. We simulate an SAE level three automated driving system. So the vehicle can maintain its speed and stay in its lane. And we assume in these experiments that these work perfectly. There's also a forward collision alert system that is imperfect. It sometimes makes mistakes. And we'll look at how those mistakes affect the driver's trust in the system. There's also an emergency braking system when an obstacle gets too close. We assume that this also works perfectly, so we don't end up with any crashes, even in our simulation environment. On the bottom, you can see that the driver gets a heads up display that the vehicle is in the auto mode. Now, according to the SAE definition of level three automated driving systems, drivers must be able to take back control of the vehicle when they're requested to or when the system fails. So here you can see a timeline of this forward collision alert system that I said we assume is imperfect. So time is on the bottom axis and we increment discrete time for every event. Whereas in the system, there's almost a minute between events, but it's not exactly the same amount of time between every event because that might be too predictive. So the experiment starts at time zero and the events happen at time T1, T2, et cetera. Now, true alarms are announced several seconds before the obstacle is encountered. False alarms occur at the time when the obstacle would have been there if it had been there. And we encode misses as something 
where there was no alert, but there was an obstacle in the, in the lane. So in any event, if the driver gets too close to the obstacle, the emergency braking will kick in and stop the vehicle when necessary. So I'm going to point to this notation LFM for true alarms, false alarms, and misses, because we'll use that when we develop our trust model. Now, in the experimental setup, the driver can activate or deactivate the system at any time. And they're also asked to do a non-driving related search task. You can see the picture there. There's one Q in a field of O's, and they get a point for every Q they find correctly. They also lose points any time the emergency brake kicks in due to their inattention to the driving task. Thus, they need to focus on both the driving task and the search task. Their total compensation for participating in the experiment ranges from a minimum of $15 to a maximum of $50 based on their performance. We designed this incentive to give them encouragement to pay enough attention to both the driving and the search task. After every event, either a true alarm or a false alarm or a miss, the simulation is paused and they're asked to report their trust change in the system. The change, as you can see on the scale on the bottom right, can be no change, slight, or significant, increase or decrease. At the end of the experiment, they'll fill out a survey about their overall trust in the system, and we'll use this final trust from the survey together with their trust changes to determine their dynamic trust. So that's the setup that we have for this specific system of trust in automated vehicles in a level three um, SAE. So let's talk about how we model and estimate trust. So if we wanna calibrate trust, we have to model it. The standard way to measure trust is through a survey. And this self-reporting has biases and it's also disruptive to interrupt the driver every so often to say, hey, how much do you trust this system? So we did it in the first experiment to get the information that we needed to match their behaviors to their trust. Now there are existing models of trust that use physiological sensors such as EEG or galvanic skin response, but those ones that we found output only a trust or a distrust value instead of a scaled value of a trust on a scale of one to 100. So in the work that we do, we use the data that we obtained in the experiment I described earlier to build this dynamic model of how trust changes over time and how trust is reflected in trusting behaviors that we can observe in a non-obtrusive manner. We'll then use that dynamic model to estimate trust in real time. So many of you are control systems experts, I could tell from the list of people on the call. So you'll understand to build a model, we need inputs and outputs. So the inputs to the model are the alarms and misses from the automation. And we assume these are Boolean variables, one or zero. Now previous research has shown that true alarms increase driver trust and both false alarms and misses decrease trust. And we observe this in our experiments as well. The outputs that we observe are the driver's trusting behaviors. These are observed between, in every interval that occurs between two events. So the first output is the focus or the percentage of time that the driver is looking at the non-driving related task or the search screen instead of at the road. The ADS usage is the percentage of time that the driver has the system engaged in the auto mode instead of manually driving. And the NDRT performance is the total number of points that the driver obtains on the search task in a time interval. Now, previous work has shown that all three of these values are positively correlated with trust, meaning that as trust increases, all of these variables are expected to increase, and we observe that in our models as well. So we take trust as the state of the system. It cannot be directly measured. Like I said, it comes from a survey. The alarm conditions are the inputs that influence trust, and the observed behaviors depend on the trust. So we have this linear systems model with the autoregressive nature of trust. The trust at event K plus one depends on the trust at event K plus the alarm condition. And the observed behaviors over the interval between K and K plus one will depend on the trust at time K. We use a linear model for simplicity and add random terms to represent individual variations. 
As I mentioned, after every event, drivers are asked about their trust change. We use this along with the final survey to determine their trust values over time, and in particular, their trust at every event. As I mentioned earlier, the forward collision system was not completely reliable. Therefore, we considered four different conditions for reliability. The baseline case was fully reliable, where all 12 events were true alarms. The three unreliable events each had four mistakes out of 12 events, with different mixes of false alarms and misses. Now, each participant experienced only one of these reliability situations because we thought it was too confusing to mix them up with a single, um, a single participant. So here you see the trust estimator that we use to estimate the driver's trust in real time. As the automated driving system gives alerts to the driver, either true or false alarms or misses, the driver reacts to those alerts by changing his or her trust and therefore trusting behavior. We assume that the trust estimator knows whether the alerts were correct or incorrect and that the estimator can observe the driver's behavior, the focus, usage of the automation, and performance on the non-driving related task. So the estimator uses these observations in the model to produce an estimate of the driver's trust in real time. Therefore, after every event, the trust estimate is updated. And now we use a common filter to show how the trust estimate changes over time. So the real observation you see in red on the right-hand side is taken from the driver reports, and the black line is the best estimate from the Kalman filter. The blue shading shows the estimate's confidence from the Kalman filter, and we assume that the trust is constant between any two events. On the event axis, you can see the circles are showing true alarms, eight of them in this case, the diamonds are false alarms, two of them, and the triangles are misses. So the change in trust is affected by the events, the true alarms, false alarms, and misses, but it also depends on the prior behavior. Now here's another example where you can see that the estimate tracks the actual, although there is quite an offset. The true and estimated trusts are converging, and perhaps 12 events is not sufficient to really achieve convergence in this model. Or perhaps this subject just underreports their trust since their behaviors are aligned with the higher trust level than they report. So this is the estimator that we're going to use for the calibration. And now that we can model and estimate trust, we're going to talk about how we can calibrate it. So the overall management framework is this combination of estimation plus calibration. And the main idea is to try to identify the states of overtrust and undertrust and influence the drivers to change their trust to come to a calibrated trust state. We assume that the automated driving system has different levels of capability in different environments. When the ADS is highly capable, such as on a clear day, a straight highway with very little traffic, the trust of the driver should be high. When the ADS has a much lower capability, such as a foggy or a rainy day, a curvy mountain road, or a dirt road, we would want the driver to have a lower trust in the ADS and spend more time monitoring the situation. So the, the driving system will attempt to influence the driver's trust through communication, either encouraging or discouraging the driver to pay attention to the road conditions. So a feedback block diagram is used for this calibrator. We don't call it control because we're not really trying to get the trust to an exact specific number, like it's not important that the trust be 67. It's more important that the trust be in the range for the capabilities of the automation. So on the far left, you see the trust estimator that we presented before. The drivers on the far right and the observed behaviors are the same as we've had in the previous experiment. The percentage of time focusing on the non-driving task, the percentage of time using the automation, and the performance on the non-driving task, finding those cues in the field of O's. Now, in this experiment that I'm going to present, we assume that the forward collision alert system is perfect. So the driver is always warned a set distance in advance of upcoming obstacles in the, in the road. 
However, the distance at which the obstacles are detected will vary based on the road conditions. <clears throat> shorter, a shorter distance for more difficult roads and a longer distance for easier conditions. So we feed the, all of these variables into the trust estimator, which <clears throat> outports a real-time estimate of driver's trust in the AV to the calibrator. Now the calibrator, as I mentioned, is sort of like a controller because it takes as inputs the estimated driver trust and the capability of the automated vehicle. Now we assume that the AV is self-aware, meaning it knows what its capabilities are in different environments. And then if there's a mismatch in the estimated driver trust and the AV capability, the trust calibrator will recommend a communication style to the AV and the AV then sends these messages to the driver. In the under-trusting case, the driver may be paying too much attention to the driving and not enough to the secondary task. As I mentioned, disusing the automation. In that case, the AV sends encouraging messages. In the over-trusting case, the driver is not paying enough attention to the driving and the AV sends warning messages to the driver. So after every event, every obstacle in the road or a miss uh, or an, a false alarm, the trust estimator sends a new estimate of trust to the calibrator compared to the AV capability and the communication style is updated. So here's the experiment that we ran. We have a course on the left with three different capability levels shown as high, medium, and low. On straight paved roads shown in dark blue, the AV is highly capable. On dirt roads, shown in red, the AV has a low capability. The curvy paved roads in light blue are medium capability. Now each driver goes through the course twice, once in each direction. <clears throat> and one of the times they're using this trust estimator and calibrator, and the other time they're not having any warnings at all, any no messages at all, it's sort of the control condition. So again, we assume that the or collision warning is perfect. And the driver still needs to be able to switch attention and take over control and drive manually around an obstacle if one is, is found in the road. The picture on the bottom shows the distance to the obstacle when the warning occurs, if it's a true alarm, which it always is in this case. But the distance to the obstacle is greater for the high capability roads and lower for the low capability situations. Again, we do 12 events in every path. And we have perfect uh, work of the emergency brake. The automation here cannot change lanes. It can only um, keep the lane, keep the speed, and emergency brake. And we use a similar incentive system in the first experiment with a minimum compensation of $15 and bonuses up to a total of $50 depending on their performance in the search task, minus any penalties when the emergency brake kicks in. So the trust calibrator shows the four different trust states that we consider. In tan across the main diagonal are the calibrated trust states. In these states, the level of trust of the driver is appropriate to the AV capability, and the AV doesn't give any messages to the driver. It's silent. In the lower left corner, the driver's trust is too low for the AV's capabilities. This is under trusting and the AV's communication style is encouraging. The dark brown states are over trusting when the trust is too high for the capabilities and the AV will warn the driver moderately. The red state in the upper right corner is the extremely over trusting state. The AV's capabilities are low while the trust is high. In this case, there's a house harsh warning issued to the driver. So I think I can try to play this movie that will show you how the trust capabilities map to the um, messages. Stop, vehicle ahead.
Are you guys able to hear the audio? No need to worry about driving. I will take care of it while you focus on yeah, finding we can the keys. Don't. road is not very easy you can still find the cues but please pay more attention to the road look i told you i do need your attention i can feel the road is terrible i don't know if i can keep us totally safe So I hope you were able to see those. These are the backup slides in case the uh, movie didn't work. And so here it are the statistical well. results. Great, thank you. So here are the statistical results of how the communication messages were able to change the driver's trust as we observed it. So we show the change in trust as observed from one interval to the next. You can, first of all, this is a human subject experiment. There's a lot of variation in the data. Each participant encountered 12 obstacles and 40 participants, so there's 480 events captured here. And we modeled trust on a 100-point scale. You can see that the encouraging message increased trust by about 17 points. When no message was issued, trust increased by a little bit. Now, this is in line with previous work that shows people's trust tends to increase over time when they use a system. The warning message resulted in a slight decrease of trusting behaviors, about seven, but the harsh warning message had a much larger effect, a decrease of more than 20 points. Here's a time plot of one particular subject going through the course. Now the gray shaded areas indicate the areas where the trust is calibrated, meaning that the driver's trust is appropriate for the AV's capabilities. This particular subject started with the paved straight roads, corresponding to a very high AV capability. However, they started out with a much lower trust. And so the two green stars you see are the encouraging messages that the automation gave to them. <clears throat> so their trust did increase, and then they switched to the medium roads, the paved curvy roads. And over that time, their trust changed a little bit, but they didn't get any messages. This was silence. But when they come out of the paved curvy roads onto the curvy dirt road, where the AV has low capability, their trust is too high and they get a big warning message to pay attention and their trust, trusting behaviors decrease. Remember, these are as trusting behaviors, which are how much they're looking at the road versus the search screen, how much they're using the automation and how well they're performing on the search task. So this is estimated trust, the purple line from that trust estimator. So, in an overall summary, when we did not, when we <clears throat> did not use the calib calibrator, meaning they just people drove this course without um, any feedback from the AV, 70% of the time the driver's trust did not align with the AV's capabilities, or there was miscalibration of trust. When we use the trust calibrator with these drivers, that miscalibration ratio was reduced from 70%. To 45 percent. Now, given the short duration of these trials, we think the results demonstrate this effectiveness of this trust calibration framework, and future work could certainly have longer trials, consider different messaging, more events, etc. So, now I will summarize with a few conclusions and talk about future work. So, I presented the results from two specific experiments. First, we built this dynamic model for trust using a linear systems framework where the next value of trust depends on the previous value plus the alert from the AV system, true alarms, false alarms, and misses. The output of the trust model is the observed driver behaviors, the focus on the search task, the use of the automation drive, automated driving system, and the performance on the search task. And we use the common filter to estimate driver's trust over time. Second, we built this trust calibrator to influence driver's trust over communication. We, if they over-trusted the AV, we gave them a warning. If they under-trusted the AV, we gave them some encouragement. So this calibration through communication was effective in helping driver's trust 
come into alignment with the capabilities of the AV. So there are many potential avenues for future work. We use a very limited set of trusting behaviors from the driver. This could be expanded in many directions. I talked earlier about using physiological sensors such as heart rate and skin conductance. We tried to use sensors in our experiments that were as unobtrusive as possible, but more sensors can always give you better results. Another consideration is that our non-driving task was a search task, which requires the same visual processing as monitoring the road. Other tasks that require audio processing or other cognitive processes will be important to consider as people think about different types of driver AV interaction. Also, we focused on the driving environment with one human in one vehicle. There are many more types of environments and tasks where humans and autonomous systems will want to team up and collaborate. We hope that these results we've presented in this simple case can help lay the groundwork for human automation trust in more diverse environments. And finally, all of this work, and indeed much of the existing work, focuses on how much the human trusts the automation. In all of our experiments, the human has the control to turn the autonomy on or off at any given time. There are interesting questions to consider about how and when the automation should trust the human. Are there circumstances that would require the autonomy to take over from the human, not allow the human to turn it off? What safety considerations are important? I'm sure there are many of the other participants at this workshop that can help us think about those questions. So thank you for your attention. I'd like to acknowledge the funding from the Automotive Research Center at the University of Michigan in collaboration with the US Army um, base in, in Warren. The graduate students who worked on this, some of whom are here, I saw. Hebert Azevedo saw has been the lead on this work and Suresh and Connor have helped. And my collaborators at Michigan, uh, Lionel and Jesse, in this um, Maverick lab. So I appreciate your attention. And I think I'm going to stop my sharing so I can see people. Okay, uh, thank you, Don, for, uh, for a, a, a terrific talk. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Um, if you have a question, please feel free to unmute and, and uh, proceed. Well, while people are getting warmed up, I have one. Um, okay. In terms of uh, 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 translating, you know, from the lab to, you know, you know, really being on the road where, um, you know, the drivers uh, could be harmed and so on. Do you, have you started any work in that, uh, on that side of things? So we have done one little mini experiment on the M city track in Michigan um, with pedestrians working, walking in front of vehicles. Um, but the research has shown that there are many similarities between the simulated environments and the, um, the real road conditions. Now we, you know, thinking about vulnerability and risk, they had the opportunity to win an extra $35 if they perform correctly. Now for undergrads, that might be a significant risk, which most of our uh, experimental subjects are, but no, it's not the same as getting into an accident or, you know, breaking your leg or having the airbag go off in the car. So there are some, differences, but I think it's in a controlled way. We did put in a little bit of, of risk in the in the system. And we have, like I said, done a, a mini experiment on, um, but we were looking at that experiment was from the pedestrian's perspective of interacting with the AV instead of the driver. But but I think it is an interesting question. Right. Don, Area for your, future um, work. After after the um, your experimental subjects did this, did you show them the um, the model and the like the sort of information that um, you, how the trust model perceived their actions and did you ask them how that did, like were they able to sort of go back and say or I, surveys as you said are obtrusive but was there a way to kind of get their feedback on the model? No, we didn't go through that with them. Um, so even though most of the students were, you know, from the university, I don't think necessarily most of them were engineering students and trying to understand what that what that might be. Um, that's an interesting thing to think about for a future set of experiments, but I don't believe we went through that with the uh, the subjects. 